Take off your face masks if you would like to do so, and we leave that entirely up to you. We ask people to sit about six feet apart so that you're more comfortable taking them off, but we also ask for you to remain seated throughout the entire service, but if you must get up, we do ask you to put your face mask back on, and if you're going to be walking within six feet of anyone, give them the chance to do the same. Well, it is so good to see everyone today. I'm Alan Akana, the Kahu, or pastor of the church, and I know we've got some returning visitors, and we might have some first-time visitors. If you are here for the first time, we have a visitor's packet for you with a gift from the church, as well as um, some information about the church and a visitor card for you to give us some information about yourself. If you didn't get one, make sure you see a deacon on the way out. We are very short on deacons today. We have people out of town and people that were just unable to make it. So uh, thank you for your patience in terms of getting, getting everyone seated this morning. Um, we do have some other announcements beginning on the top of page five. And one of those is the temporary worship guidelines, which we've had now for quite a few months. So if you've been coming, that's all gonna be old stuff to you, but if you haven't been here for a while, please take a look at the top of page five and just know what our pandemic guidelines are for now. And also along those lines, we're not handing out an, an offering bowl or plate during the pandemic. So if you are especially blessed by our time together and would like to make a gift to the church, you're invited to do so afterwards. You can place your gift right here in the offering bowl. And we also have an offering basket right outside the main doors. Today is our church council meeting, and so the church council, about 10 minutes after the worship service, will meet right back in here. And so there's no Ho'okipa wellness class today. And um, what we do have going on today is the five o'clock hike to Mahalapu or Mahaulepu and Makawahi. One of my favorite things about going out there this time of year is the Mayapilo are in, are in bloom 
more than any other time of the year, in my experience anyway. And the Mayapilo are the native little tiny flowers, uh, indigenous to Hawaii, that grow on the ocean cliffs and they open up at night. So just as the sun's setting, they open up in all their glory and they're open up all night long for all the ants and the bees and whatever other pollinators there are out there. And then in the morning when the sun comes up, they start to droop and they just keep drooping and that's it. So one flower gets one night to just shine. And I was on a, um, uh, a Zoom meeting a couple weeks ago and we're talking about giving a gift to somebody and I suggested flowers and somebody said to me, oh, men just aren't all that into flowers. And um, those of you that know me, just uh, there was a few people from this church that were on that Zoom meeting, and they all just laugh, like, boy, I've never seen anybody as into flowers as our kahu. And I, I paint them all the time, almost every day. Part of my practice is just watercoloring Hawaiian flowers. And the Maya Pilo is one of my all-time favorite. And so we're going to gather here at 5 o'clock in the parking lot. We're going to carpool out there. We're going to park near CJM Stables, but... Um, Try to come here rather than meet us out there because if we don't know you're out there somewhere, you, you, we, you may miss us altogether. So anyway, um, we will be back to the cars by dark. That's the plan. However, just in case, we're asking anybody who's coming to bring a flashlight this evening, just in case somebody falls or just can't leave those Maya Pilo alone and the sun goes down, um, bring a flashlight, bring some water, and um, the... Uh, the ocean spray is probably going to hit you a little bit. Um, the waves are huge this weekend, probably bigger than I've ever seen them before. But we're going to be up high enough. So the only thing I think that would keep us from going on this trip this evening is if there's just a torrential downpour and we can't see. So let's pray for good weather. And we're looking forward to this really fun adventure. And then the other thing is we have a... Um, a fun event coming up, and I'm going to ask Skylar and Rory Shim to help me uh, share this. And if you guys will just come up to either side of me, and uh, actually, why don't you guys stay right here in the middle since you've got your face masks on right here by the table? And we will be in the Koloa Plantation Days Parade two Saturdays from now, the 30th of July. And the theme is gather together again. And so we're inviting people to gather together here at Koloa Union Church. And we're asking people to come um, about 8.30 in the morning. And we'll give more details in the weekly news. But uh, this is just a fun thing that we did every year all the way up until the pandemic. So they're doing the parade again, and we're going to be in it. Thank you so much, Skylar and Rory. You can sit down now. And then I, I did want to say that uh, we've heard from some of our kupuna, some of our elderly folks, that they would love to be in the parade, but they just can't walk from the school all the way down to the park. And so just this morning, we secured a couple of golf carts that sit, I think, four people. And so we can, uh, besides the driver, we can sit like six kupuna or anybody else that's just unable to walk. And then um, Michael will be driving his car with a trailer attached, and so we can fit a few more people in there. So we can, we can fit about eight people. If you would like to go and you just can't walk the whole time, we want you to be a part of what we're doing. So here's the deal. First come, first serve. The, um, there is a bulletin board sign-up sheet. So a sign-up sheet that says Koloa Plantation Days Parade on the bulletin board. If you want to make sure that you're going to have a seat in one of the, the carts or in the vehicle, um, put um, cart or golf cart in parentheses. And again, once we fill up to like eight people, that's, that's as much as we can do. So we've just secured those this morning. We've been working on it for weeks, and I just got a notification today that we've got the two golf carts. So, whew. so anyway, I'm looking forward to it. This will be our chance to just kind of shine again as a congregation. And a couple weeks ago, I think I announced that next year, is the centennial of Koloa Union Church since we became Koloa Union Church. It's 99 years this year. Next year will be 100 years, and we will be, as a church, the Grand Marshal in the parade. So this is an exciting time. And I think that's it for the announcements that I need to cover today. Our theme is Christ in You. And as we begin our service today, think about what Christ means to you. 
Think about what it means having Christ in you and sit with that for just a moment as we begin today's worship service. Come, let us open our eyes so that we, so that we may see the presence of God in all things. Let us open our minds so that we might understand that God shows up even in the most unlikely places. Let us open our hearts so that we may know the loving presence of God within us. Let us open our arms so that we might welcome others into the embrace of God. Let us open our hands so that we may freely share the compassion of God with all for the fullness of God is in every place. Let us pray. O oh God, may we welcome your presence within us, and may we acknowledge your presence in all places and at all times. When we have a hard time seeing you in the world, may we have clarity of vision. When we see you in ourselves, only when we have accomplished great things, may we let go of our need to impress you. When we only see you in people who are similar to us, may we set down our notions that some persons are more valuable than others. When we only see you in our own ways of living, organizing, and worshiping, may we remember that there are many ways that people live and understand you. May we truly see you in all people, in all places, and at all times. Amen. Today's Old Testament reading is from Psalm 15. Listen for the word of God. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Those who walk blamelessly and do what is right and speak the truth from their heart, who do not slander with their tongue and do no evil to their friends, nor heap shame upon their neighbors in whose eyes the wicked are despised, but who, but who honor those who fear the Lord, who stands by their oath, even to their hurt, who do not lend money at interest, and who do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be moved. Today's New Testament reading is from the letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15, 15 through 29. Listen for the word of God. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in Christ, all things in heaven and on earth were created. Things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through the Christ and for Christ. Christ is before all things, and in Christ all things hold together. Christ is the head of the body, the church. Christ is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that Christ, may, might, so that Christ might come to have first place in everything. For in Christ all the fullness of God was, placed to, was pleased to dwell. And through Christ, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through, blood, through the blood of the cross. And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, Christ has now reconciled in his fleshy, fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith, without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, I, Paul, became a minister of this gospel, and am, I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and even and in my flesh, I am competing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body, that is, the church, I became its minister according to God's commission that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, 
but has now been revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is Christ whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this, I toil and strive with all the energy that he powerfully inspires within me. Today's gospel reading is from Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Listen for the word of God. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary who sat at Jesus' feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things, but few, but few things are needed, indeed only one. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. May God bless the reading of the word, and may our hearts be open to receiving it. This next song is considered a Hawaiian hymn written by John Almeida. Sadly, I can't perform it with my son today. He became ill and was advised not to come to church today. Um, but it's Tinkanaka Vai Vai. Vai Vai is like a term for someone who's, who is immensely rich. Of course, man is Kanaka. So it's about a rich man who asks, who asks Lord, what, what, what do I have to do to um, uh, enter heaven? Um, and, and the Lord says, a, this is the chorus. It says, A Ha'avi Lilo. Ha'avi is give, Lilo completely. So give completely. Um, Iko Mao Vai Vai, all your many riches. And then turn to follow me to gain eternal life. Uh, there's a second verse that goes with this song that we don't normally sing. Unfortunately, the man had it, had it, didn't have it in his heart to give away all of his riches to help the, the world. And so it says, Aole, Aehiki, Ke Kanaka Vai Vai, the rich man shall never reach the kingdom of heaven. And it's based on a, um, a, uh, a Bible verse that says, it is easier for a camel to go through the needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into, into the kingdom of God, unless in his heart he can give up his riches. Let me walk through paradise with you, Lord. Take my hand and lead me there. All my earthly treasures I will gladly give. Teach me how to love and how to share. And lust and vanity were mine, Lord. Then I found your love divine. Now on my knees I pray that I can find the way. Let me walk through paradise with you. Eh Oh, 
song and uh, thanks for switching things up when Spencer got sick this morning. I don't know if you could hear Doug uh, at the very beginning but his son was supposed to sing that song and uh, Spencer uh, is ill so Doug just kind of changed it up a little bit and uh, sang it for us so thank you Doug. Well when you think of all the great mysteries in the world what comes to your mind? I'm guessing that some of you, like me, saw some of the images this past week from the James Webb telescope. I just want you to know that I found those images just absolutely mind-boggling. I remember looking at a, a picture about this big on my computer screen and seeing a hundred kind of just little dots of light. Actually, there was hundreds of them, plus a bunch of starbursts. And as I was reading the caption, I realized that every one of those little dots is a galaxy. And I was looking at hundreds of them. And as the article that I was reading explained, if you could hold up one grain of sand at arm's length, that's the amount of space that shows up in that one little image, just a pinprick of the sky. And scientists tell us that there are literally thousands of galaxies in that one pinprick. And we're looking at the image of one pinprick. And if you think about it, and you think of all the sand, you know, specks of dust or the little tiny pieces of sand you could put up throughout the, the entire universe, Scientists tell us that they now know that there are trillions of galaxies. Trillions. And the Milky Way alone, our galaxy, contains, what is it, a, a hundred billion stars? It really is mind-boggling to think about how great the universe is and how mysterious it is. And it made me think as I was reading the article about how, you know, this is really humbling to think about me being one of billions of people on this tiny little planet that's circling one of the stars amongst, what, billions in our galaxy, and there are trillions of galaxies. It, it kind of puts things into perspective a little bit for me, but. More than anything, I kept thinking, oh, the mystery of it all. The mystery of all that we don't know. 
And as I thought about mystery, it occurred to me that mystery has always been a part of the human experience. As long as there have been people around thinking about meaning and where we fit into the universe, there has always been mystery. And there always will be. No matter how much we learn, there will always be way more than we, than we don't know. And so today, as I was looking over our New Testament reading in Colossians, it occurred to me that the Apostle Paul and his followers talked about mystery, and they dealt with it in their writings. And so Paul talked about mystery that is becoming known, or has become known a mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages. And Paul writes about this early on in the book of Romans and 1 Corinthians. And he doesn't tell us specifically what this mystery is. It's left a little vague, at least for a while. And then Paul does tell us it has something to do with Christ and it has something to do with wisdom but he never seems to have labeled it. And then Paul died. Last week I explained how many biblical scholars believe that Paul didn't actually write the book of Colossians. It was probably written as long as 20 to 25 years after he died. And last week I explained why people in that day were writing things in Paul's name, partly just so they wouldn't be killed by the Roman government. But also, all the books in the Bible that scholars now believe that Paul's name is attached to that he didn't actually write, they think, you know, the people that received these letters knew that Paul had died. He was their leader, at least in all the Gentile churches, the non-Jewish, mainly non-Jewish churches throughout the Roman Empire. They knew Paul had died, and somebody's writing him a letter in Paul's name. They knew it wasn't Paul, but they knew that it was most likely one of Paul's favorite students or a group of his students. And that's really what Colossians is. At least that's what many biblical scholars believe today. The letter to the Colossians written as a pseudonym in Paul's name. And so in this letter to the Colossians, the writer becomes very clear about what this mystery is. In Colossians, we are told, here's the mystery. It is Christ in you. Think about that for just a moment. So there has been, according to Romans and 1 Corinthians, decades earlier, and now in Colossians, there's this idea of a mystery that's kept hidden throughout the ages. And the writer of Colossians is finally identifying it by saying, basically, here's what Paul meant. The mystery, this great mystery that we all should celebrate now that it's becoming, it has become revealed is Christ is actually in you. Now, we have heard that probably since Sunday school and we're probably like, eh, no big deal, we've always known that. But imagine hearing that for the first time. So in order for people to really grasp how great this mystery is, the writer of the letter of Colossians explains, first of all, the nature of Christ. And in order to understand how great this mystery is, we first of all have to understand who and what is Christ. And so in Colossians, we're told Christ is the image of the invisible God. Now, just sit with that for a second. The image of the invisible God. In the Greek language, the word for image here is icon, where we get the English word icon. And an icon back then and always has been, even today, is this idea of it's an image representing something else. 
It's not the thing itself. And I like how many Greek Orthodox and frankly Russian Orthodox, the Orthodox Church itself, the, the Eastern Church describes an image. They say, when we look at our images, it's not so much looking at them, it's looking through them. They're like our windows to God. They help us understand God. And so what the writer of the letter to the Colossians is really saying is Jesus is what we look to and look through to understand God. Now again, the image isn't the thing itself. Now I want you to know that it took the church hundreds of years to kind of figure this out. It wasn't until the fourth century that there was actually a statement that everyone agreed on. This is what we believe about Christ and Christ's divinity. But back then in the first century, in the second half of the very first century, they had figured out in the church that Jesus is this image. If we look carefully at Jesus, we get a glimpse of God. Now, one of the things that occurred to me as I was reading this passage this week, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, looking at this image of the universe, basically just a pinprick in the sky, I thought, wow, sometimes we think we've got the universe all figured out, but we know we don't. There's so much out there we don't know. But in the same way, sometimes we think we've got God all figured out too, don't we? We think, oh, I've got my Bible. I understand God completely. If, if you have any questions, just come to me and I'll find it in the Bible and that'll settle everything. And from now on, we'll just know that we know everything and there's no more mystery left. But it's actually the same as looking out into the universe. When we look at Christ, we get a very clear image of God. But that's really just a little bit of God that we get to look at at a time, isn't it? So I have been to churches where the preacher will say things like, I've got it all figured out because I have a Bible and that will answer every single question you have. Just bring me a question and I'll boom, bring you an answer. And to me, as I'm holding the book of Colossians this week on the one hand, and I'm also holding and looking at this image of the universe, I'm thinking there is so much about God that I will never understand, even if I spend the rest of my life trying to. So the idea here is that Christ is the image of the invisible God. And invisible meaning you can't see all of God. We know that already. But then the writer of the letter to the Colossians goes on to say, but Christ is the firstborn. Christ is the one who was there before creation. Christ is the one in whom all things are create, were created and hold together. So it's this, it's this idea that Christ is not God the Father, or the Creator, or as we now call the first person of the Trinity, but Christ has this divinity and this temporality that goes way beyond what our minds are capable of even understanding. Christ was there before the creation of the world. Christ was there creating it with God, the creator. Christ was there and is still there holding it all together. So there's this idea here that Christ is not God, the creator, but yet Christ somehow has this special relationship with God, the creator. And when we look to Christ, we get the clearest picture of basically the universe, what God is really like. Well, what I love about Colossians is it doesn't just leave us there. It takes us to this altogether new level and says that in Christ is the fullness of God. So it's not that Christ is just another human being or another good religious teacher that we should follow to learn more about God. There's something special about the nature of Christ, the fullness of God is actually in Christ, not just a little bit of God, not just a lot of God even. The fullness of God is in Christ. And then the letter 
to the Colossians, the writer of that letter, then basically blows the minds of all the people that are reading this letter for the first time saying, and Christ is in you. And that is the mystery. The fullness of God is in Christ and Christ is in you. Basically what he's saying is each and every one of you, all of us have the fullness of Christ in us. Imagine what your life could be like if you could just wrap your head around that for a moment. If you could understand that the fullness of God in Christ is in you, and in you, and you, and all those people out there. When I think about the implications of all this, it is truly mind-boggling. If I could understand that the fullness of God is in me, and in everybody, even the people I don't like at all, wow, imagine. And here's the thing. Colossians helps us to understand the most important implication of this. In chapter one, one of the major themes of all of Colossians is peace and reconciliation. And I'll tell you, if you could wrap your head around the fact, as I just said, that the fullness of God is in you and in everybody else, and as Colossians said, in all creation, just think how people would treat each other, even if they disagreed, even if they didn't understand, even if they didn't like, if you could look at every other person and say, oh my gosh, yes, but the fullness of God is in you. The fullness of God, and I will treat you accordingly. So the idea here is looking for the fullness of God in you, first of all, as an individual, and being grateful for that, and, and, and letting that just kind of blow your mind, like looking at the images from the Webb telescope. Wow, the fullness of God is actually in me? Just think how you might live your life differently if you actually believe that. And then, realizing, as Colossians says, the fullness of Christ is in everybody else and in all creation. Those galaxies out there that we haven't even identified yet, the fullness of God is everywhere. And so this idea of peace and reconciliation is treating each other, treating every other person as someone who has the fullness of God in them. In other words, how would you treat God if God showed up like Jesus and started walking on this earth? That's the mystery. And as the, letter, the writer to the letter of Colossians knew at the time, it's hard to live our lives in community. And especially it's hard to live our lives in a nation where the government, those in charge, don't seem to recognize at all that the fullness of God is in everybody. That there's value, ultimate value in every human being. Our job as followers of Jesus, according to Colossians, is to treat everybody according to this mystery that the fullness of God is not only in me, but it's in everybody else as well. And this idea of reconciliation means that something's broken and needs to be fixed. And I, I don't think I have to tell any of you that we live in a broken world. We live in a world where there's injustice. We live in a world where people lie and run for president. We live in a world where people are just not very caring about other people. The mystery and the answer to all of this is recognizing that the fullness of God is in Christ and Christ is in you and that fullness is in every other person. Now I wanna take this just one step further because how we have treated this earth and how we have treated this universe as human beings has not been very kind. Seems like so much of what we have done is whoever has the most money and the most power gets the most stuff and they do whatever they want with it regardless of what it does to our aina, our land, 
the sky, the water. And who knows what's next out there, what people might do when they think they can start owning other planets and galaxies and things like that. We must wrap our head around this idea that the fullness of God is not only in every person, but in everything, so that we will treat everyone and all things with respect and honor, because it's all created by God in love. As I was reflecting on all this this past week, I thought, perhaps that really is the meaning of salvation for us. The meaning of salvation is recognizing the fullness of Christ in everyone and everything, and living like you truly believe that. Well, we can start living like that today. We can start believing that today. And that's my encouragement to you to spend some time today and this week to really think about what that means for you in your life, that the fullness of God is in you, in everyone else, and everything else. Amen. And it's now time for the prayers of the people, if we have any cards. Thank you, Michael. And as I just about, I'm just about to read those, I want to call your attention to page seven in the bulletin in, on which we have all the things that we pray for throughout the week. And please let us know if there's anything that you would like for us to add. Um, and so we have both joys and concerns. Um, one is happy birthday to Belinda. Happy birthday, Belinda. And glory to God for my new job is the executive assistant with Habitat for Humanity. Melissa Gregory, congratulations. Wonderful news. Our prayers are answered. Wonderful. And then happy, oh, from Sheila, happy birthday to Jim and blessings through the year. Happy birthday, Jim, and blessings. I also um, recently heard that uh, our good friend, the Reverend Phyllis Megan, has been ill and just chatted with her through text over the last couple days and uh, just wanted to keep her health in our prayers. And I don't really have any details to share, but um, apparently it's made a significant difference in her life and what she's up to these days. And so let's pray for Reverend Phyllis. And now I will give us all an opportunity to, in silence, reflect, give thanks to God for all of our blessings and lift up any requests that you have to God. And after a moment, I'll lead us in a verbal prayer. Let us pray together. Holy God, we give you thanks today for reminding us that your fullness is indeed in all of us, that it's everywhere, that there's no place we can go in this universe and not find you in your fullness. And so, God, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds and teach us how to treat all people and all things with respect, with dignity with compassion, grace, and mercy. And God, we give you thanks for the many, many blessings that we have experienced this past week. We thank you for the birthdays and anniversaries and all the things that we have celebrated. We also thank you for new jobs and for new opportunities that many of us have just realized that we have this past week. And God, most importantly, we thank you for one another, for the opportunity in relationships, in families, and in this church community to be together, to experience your love, and to love one another. 
And God, today we pray for all those who are ill, and we add Reverend Phyllis and also Spencer Duvichel to our list of people that we are praying for. And God, we know that not only the ones who are listed on our prayer list, but so many others are struggling in life because of both illness and injury. We pray for healing wherever possible. We pray for peace and we pray for comfort. And God, we also know that there are many places in this world where people are struggling day to day because of violence and warfare. And we especially remember Ukraine and pray for your will to be done in that country and in that region of the world. We pray for peace and we pray for justice. God, we also pray for all those who are victims of violence in our own country, gun violence, domestic violence, and in so many ways where people are not treated with dignity and respect. Oh God, may there be peace and reconciliation in so many places that need it so deeply. And God, as we continue to figure out our way through this pandemic, and especially as school is about to start in a couple of weeks, we pray for health, for healing, for wisdom, for our teachers and principals and school boards throughout this state and throughout our country. We pray for an end to the pandemic and healing throughout the world. And God, we ask that you give all of our leaders, our president, our senators, congressmen and women, all the way down to our local leaders here on this island, give them all wisdom and compassion. Give them a heart of love and justice for all people. And God, we also pray for our planet, this earth, whom we confess we have not treated with love and kindness. We pray for her healing. We pray for justice. And we pray that we would all do our part to make it so. And God, now as this prayer comes to a close, we know that there are so many people that have so many other things that they're praying for and about. And we ask, oh God, that we would not only be mindful of you hearing our prayers, but that we would also be committed to listening to you, to your voice through them. Amen. my 
daily bread. You are my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. Yes, I. for you yes I I'm lost without you and I I'm lost without you desperate for you. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence time to put our face masks back on. And as a reminder, we ask you to fully cover your nose and your mouth and to keep your face mask on until you are either completely off the property or back in your vehicle. And now would you stand for the benediction? Your holy presence living in me were the final words that Doug just sang for us. And that really is the message of today. God's holy presence is in each of us, in all people and everywhere. And so as we go from this place, may we look for it, may we recognize it, and may we celebrate it. May the love of God, the grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the comfort and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and with all people now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.